All right, welcome to the podcast. On today's show with Vanessa from Health Aid. Thanks for joining. Thanks for, for having me. For people who don't know, what's your company? What is the company that you sold? What, are the, what, is, what does it do? Health Aid Kombucha. So for those that aren't familiar with kombucha, it's a fermented tea, rich in probiotics, healthy acids, great for the gut. So the buzzword of probiotics just means you're introducing all the good bacteria into the gut to help fortify your system. And you took this company from zero yep. to... Uh, what, what over, were you guys, 200 million? Uh, north, we're probably closer to 300 million in retail sales right now. Okay. And 50,000 doors. Okay. Um, there's about 150,000 doors in the U.S. universe, so good amount of them. So you're almost all of them. Yeah, okay. the ones that matter maybe right yeah, now. Yeah, that's amazing. Okay, yeah. so let's go to the beginning. So at the beginning, I read that you guys were trying to make a, first of all, you and your co-founders all decided to start a company. Yes. And so that's step one. So three people get together. They're all like, let's start something. Let's leave our jobs. Yeah. And then you wanted to do a hair loss product. Yes, that's exactly right. So all three of us, I remember we were just trying to solve problems in this world, whether it's parking spots on Santa Monica or measuring your heat of your meat in your oven. Um, one of the problems was hair loss, and we tried to solve it through kombucha, not drinking it, but actually uh, brewing the kombucha to get this hair loss culture for hair. One of our co-founders, Justin, he was working for a hair loss entrepreneur, and he just saw so much potential there for an all-natural product. And 50% of the consumers in that world were not were women from Asia, actually. And so, like, we can totally tap into this. Let's do something different. So we started doing that through kombucha, much to our chagrin. Kombucha, we're not, we're not going to be the ones to create the hair loss cure because we're just not clinicians. We don't have all the things that it's we need. To it's a lot. Yeah. And we kind of threw our hands up in the air like, whatever, let's just sell this at the farmer's market. It was the quickest way we knew how to get it out to the market. And we sold, our birthday was actually uh, March 25th, 2012. So we just celebrated. That's your first farmer's market? That was market? our first farmer's market. It was oh our first God. sale. And what flavor did you guys launch with at the, at the yeah, what kind of flavor? Uh, two, OG, so original, and ginger lemon. Those are our two hallmark flavors. Ginger lemon's still around. We retired original a couple years into the game. The farmer's market world is so fascinating. Yeah. I mean, I remember doing, I had a bow tie company and I did the farmer's market stuff. And I remember just like, our first one was so sad. It was, we went to Goodwill and we just bought an ironing board and like, comforters and we use the comforters as like a rug oh. in our 10 by 10 tent yep. mm -hmm. and we got there at like 6 a.m at soa actually in boston okay that was the first one we did and it was just so such a hustle but you, a hustle. Could, you could make like a grand you could make like one that like on a bad day i think we made 600 on a great day i think it was maybe 1500 dollars a day that's pretty good and it was amazing that's pretty good yeah no it was but it was a hustle like you it's had hustle. you had to you had to really uh, solicit people you had to know how to talk to people oh yeah i mean they it's the, a real thing the one that they put us in was brentwood and they put okay. us in the back row by the bathrooms no one really knew we were there so we had to go out to the front like row we had to you know ask them do you want a sample of kombucha and literally walk them over to our booth have them sample That's it the hustle do the it's the hustle do the yeah. spiel talk to them have them walk away with a little bottle and we just worked it and you could definitely tell who was going to make it in the farmer's market didn't that's you know? what i love about the farmer's market yeah. you know yeah you, you know. know the people that are going to do that forever yeah and never yeah i love that about it yeah it was a good training ground in 2012 what was the world of kombucha like the people know was it a super small market was it just like the super, super healthy small. Super, super small. It's okay. probably like this microcosm of really healthy eaters in LA and pockets of like LA's Pacific a good Northwest. Place. Yeah. yeah. There were probably two brands out that were national at that point. And we were just coming to the market like, hey, let's create something that was super high quality, tasted good, approachable, but also from a branding standpoint, very different from what's on the market. Something that's polarizing, fun, bubbly, both in terms of actual product and actual branding that represented as us and our lifestyles. And everything that was on the market was very yogi-ish, very Eastern and um, small, but now it's over a billion dollar category today. Before it was, it was much less, probably yeah. half of that. And you guys are responsible for some of that, which is crazy. Yeah. How, how many years did you do the farmer's market? We did it for um, probably three to four years actually, but wow. The first year was year of farmer's markets, and we quickly realized that's not going to make us any money. So sure. 2013, we moved into wholesale, and we didn't know about distributors, so we self-delivered all of our product to stores around Smart. Los Angeles. Smart. So you had a small radius, I imagine. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. The hot spots is, you know, West Hollywood, yep. Palisades, 
arts district, all the hot spots of where people would be drinking kombucha. Sure. And we went from zero stores to 250 in 2013. And going zero deep, to 250. Yeah. Yeah. That's huge. That's a pretty good growth year. And so where are you making it at the beginning of 2013? Is it still your home? Like, uh, we, are you home I, brewers? We were home brewers, but <laughs> okay. then we also used a commercial kitchen license from this bakery in Manhattan Beach. Bless okay. her heart, Laura, cake bake shop, not around anymore. But we worked there on the weekends as her clerks to give her a break. And we also used her kitchen so we can ferment there. So you made a kombucha. deal with it. Exactly. And so we didn't have to pay much rent at that time, but then we also were just free labor for her, basically. Yeah. Um, we used her commercial kitchen license, and that is really you know, helped us to get into the farmer's market and into these stores. At what point did you have to go into a full-scale brewery? It was 2014. So okay, so was, right after you get into yeah. 250 stores, you yeah. see the volumes, things are moving. Yeah, it was okay. actually one of those um, oh shit moments because we were growing so fast. We're like, okay, we need our own brewery. And then we subleased from, there's a Japanese uh, fast food restaurant called Sansei. They have a test kitchen. So we ended up mm-hmm. subleasing from them, and that was our first official kitchen in Gardena. And that's where we kind of started brewing. And then in 2014, we were still growing, and we moved to our kitchen in Van Nuys and we were there for a couple years it's always hard to like whenever I think about the moment I I went through Y Combinator the program Mm. and when we did that everyone would ask like when do you know it's time to quit your job and the best answer I've ever heard is you'll know yeah yeah (laughs) like you'll know exactly the moment yeah. When, when was that moment for you guys? Um, so, okay, it was the end of 20, well, it was mid-2013 for me, and my co-founders okay. quit at the end of 2013. So maybe you're at 200 stores, 150 yeah. stores, yeah. You're, you're way too busy, you're yeah. on the road all the time. Totally. It yeah. was, um, you know, by day we're working our corporate jobs. I was also going to business school at that time, so I was going to school at night. Like nights and weekends, we're brewing or selling or doing whatever we had to do for the business. And something had to give at that point. It was either like sanity, sleep, you know, some, it was the job, the nine to five job. And it was, if we didn't add energy to it, we knew that it was just going to wither and die. And so I, I knew for myself, I was confident enough to say, you know, I'll give this a year. And if it doesn't work out, then I can find a job. I can do something with mm-hmm. my life. Mm-hmm. But I needed to give this a chance or else I would have regrets forever. And so I imagine at that time, you guys aren't paying yourself that much. No. If anything. No. All the money's going right back into the business. Yep. Okay. So you open, let's say you open 2014. Are you thinking about investors or are you guys just bootstrapping this yourself? Like where is your mind at in terms of, all right, I think we have something. We're quitting our jobs. Yeah. Is it that, are you even there in terms of thinking about outside money? Yeah, I mean, we needed money. Cause, and when we realized that was July of 2013, when we couldn't okay. pay our credit card bills, basically. So, That's right, because you're front-loading so much product. Yeah. Right, so you're just getting in debt. Yeah, working capital, inventory. Yeah, inventory. And yeah. then growth okay. was just taking off. So, okay. And then we also realized the cash cycle of some of these places are net 30, net 60. And so we're not getting paid for even sure. the things we're front-loading. Sure. And so we actually launched the Kickstarter in summer of 2013. That failed... <laughs> brilliantly, I guess, because okay. it was in the midst of that Kickstarter that our current investors actually found us. Um, so good marketing. Uh, yeah. So marketing, they actually found us at one of the shops in Brentwood and they called us. And so just happenstance, they gave us a ring. We answered, which we barely do. And then um, we, that's kind of history in terms of how we ended up raising money from them. But we knew we needed money somehow. My dad had given us a loan. Dinah's dad gave us a loan. We were just living on literally air at that point, paying ourselves maybe $300 every six weeks. And despite the feeling of that, did you did you guys know you were onto something? Because you could see the product moving. Oh, yeah. I mean, every week we're sold out. And it wasn't just like, a, oh, we woke up like this and we sold out. It was a hustle from the farmer's market into those stores because yeah. you had to hustle to get into those stores demo, merchandise, make sure the product looks great. So we felt it at the store level because people were like, oh, this actually tastes pretty good. I'm going to buy a case of it. And so you saw the demand, not just in being sold out every week, but you also felt that je ne sais quoi when you're in the store talking to people. It was electric and also the thrill of it kind of like made you want to go back again, even though you knew it was like painful in the process. I love the story so much because I feel like when I think about entrepreneurship today in 2024, so 10 years ago from when you guys were really scaling it, it's so different today. You know, in 2014 or 20, yeah, 2014, your Instagram's probably just coming out. Yeah. So it's not the world today where it's like 
get Haley Bieber to take a photo with your product and you know that alone can do something or TikTok wasn't even a thing yeah it wasn't even a thing and so at these times which is weird to say but it's like really it's really a lot of just talking to the customer sure you can get somewhat sophisticated on digital ads but it's hard yeah we didn't so the the product connected Mm -hmm. your product just connected it did, and we weren't digitally native, as people say. You were too um, busy, probably. We're too busy. We're three, like, out go, there. yeah, yeah. Um, and we didn't know how to work SEO at that time, and we also couldn't ship our product e-commerce-wise. It was refrigerated and heavy, so it didn't actually make sense to do that. And, and so it was we had gla- to, was it glass. It was in glass. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so, yeah. you know, sometimes we shipped the product, and <laughs> that ended in flames at times, but. Uh, but connecting in real life actually really mattered because we got to explain the product, explain our story. People really connected to that and also how we made it. We got to really unveil some myths about kombucha and what people thought about it just by talking to them and having them try it. So that made a world of difference. So in the world of classical marketing, field marketing really helped us in the beginning. I think that's a secret to CPG, honestly. When I, when I view it from today, yeah. from today's point of view, I'm just like, look, if, there's, if there isn't a team out there that c- continues to just do field, I, I, I don't see how you win. Yeah. yeah. It doesn't matter what your Instagram is. Like right. all that stuff goes away, right? The it does. news cycle is like 24 hours. Yeah. I'm sure you might see a spike, but it's like, you got to be in the field. Yeah. And it's a lot of things all at once. So it's expensive over time. That's true. What happens in 2015 to the company? So 2015, we got, so uh, the investors who called us in 2013, we ended up closing the uh, Series A at the end of 2013. So 2014, 2015. How big of a raise was that? uh, It was our Series A, so just under 3 million, so that we raised. And I mean, we needed it because we were like, the the seams were breaking. Like we needed to fuel the demand. Uh, And it was so fun because we got to move into our new brewery in Van Nuys. We got to build that out grow into the natural channel. So we were like fixated on being the whole foods brand of kombucha and we wanted to follow that whole foods consumer on their journey. So it was really about getting into the places that whole foods consumer shop. So it wasn't just be in the grocery stores, be in the cool coffee shop. It was be in the cool restaurant, it was be in the hotels, be in the workout, whether it be Soul Cycle or Berries or whatever you, know, you were a part of, we wanted to be seen there because we also wanted to be part of that mental disruption as well without even putting words to it like that. We just knew we wanted to be part of that conversation with the tastemakers. And what were your revenues like at 2015, so after the raise? Oh, goodness. So were you in was, the tens yet? We were in the tens in 2015. So I think in 2014, we were just under 10. Okay. We went from like, two to eight essentially and then eight to like let's say mid-20s and at some point i don't know how sophisticated the investors that got in were but do they have board seats are they thinking like let's bring in a ceo who's done this and brought it to 50 million 100 million or are they in your ear or are you guys like in Um, control they were pretty sophisticated but uh so first beverage they've been great partners from the beginning to now at the time they had managing partners who were also founders so they really, and beverage founders, so they really knew the drill. Yeah. And they were, they did have board seats, but they were also like, you guys are doing your thing. We're here, you know, call us if you need help with contracts, you know, who connections to whatever it may be. So they really understood what it meant to kind of do the slog in the beginning. And because Tom first, he sold his juice off of a boat in Nantucket. And so he knew the drill yeah. and he knew what we were going through. And that was really helpful, I think, just having the understanding of where the founder's coming from. So the board seats were more of like a formality of the Series A raise. Okay. Um, they were very much part of the team, and we love that. At what point do you raise capital again? Well, this was the uh, very um, rose-colored glasses optimist in me and Dinah. Um, so there's three co-founders, and yeah. we're all best friends, and they're also married. And, and still best friends, And right? still best friends. That's I amazing. think that's the better success that of it all, That is the better too. success, yeah. But we were you know, optimists from the beginning. We're like, yes, we raised our money, our Series A. We're going to take this to 100 mil. Never have to raise again. We're done. We're going to be successful. Yay. And then at the end of 2015, I mean, we felt like failures because we had to raise our Series B, but we just didn't understand the cycle of growth fundraising and ultimately like scaling so you, you guys aren't just hitting the numbers you wanted to hit no we did you we did. exceeded them and oh. it was like that was the um that Whoa. was the beauty and the problem we just needed more money to fuel the growth basically 
So because of that, we didn't, and we didn't truly understand the runway cycle of money. We were just too green at that time. We were ready to kill it, but we also didn't realize the nuts and bolts of it until after Series B, basically. It's like when you're on Everest and you're like, oh, I'm on Everest. Yeah. I, I didn't see that. Yeah, yeah. Like I didn't <laughs> we know. We were just trekking ahead. Right, you're just going. Yeah. <laughs> but our partners were great. They came in, Series B led the whole round. Our friends and family came in in the Series A round, so it was really great ultimately to have them in that journey with us because they saw us from the beginning and rooting us on too. At what point did you feel like that you you guys were comfortable? Because at the same time when these people generally come in, they can, you can maybe take a note or draw or, but for, for other than most of your equity, you're not paying yourselves that much. And sometimes they cap you, yeah, which is I hilarious. Mean, I never felt comfortable until 2020. One, yeah. which is when ultimately yeah. I, yeah, I was, uh, we had sold the transaction, but I don't think there's ever a level of comfort you can have when you're a founder operator, because there's too many things in the business, even if you take chips off, off the table. And I personally didn't take chips off the table the whole time. So I was constantly in this state of my nest egg is at risk all the time. So it was constantly this. That's the PTSD. That is the PTSD that you live for. Do you regret that? Like, do you wish maybe you took little I little do. rewards? Yeah. 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 I wish I did. And I tell a lot of the founders I advise now. I'm like, totally. look, you have success. You've hit all your milestones. Like, you, you don't have to make it so hard on yourself. Yeah. Um, That's like, good advice. Take your mental health day. Take some chips off the table. <laughs> plan your for your future. One of the founders I advise, he just got married. He wants a family soon. I'm like... Yo, like, don't need to be a martyr for anyone <laughs> here. Like, you are trying, like, you are doing this and you're creating value for a lot of people. That's Look great advice. I'm glad too. you're doing that. Yeah. Yeah. It's good to reward yourself. And it's, I mean, it, I think it's necessary more so than anything else. Oh, yeah. It's a lot. It's a, it's a sprinted marathon, basically. Like, yeah. it's a marathon that you're sprinting the whole time. So you got to give yourself some type of juice. At what point do you get any acquisition offers? At what point yeah. is it is like are people circling and they're trying to court you into either yeah. acquisition or You know, it's interesting. There wasn't like any outright like, hey, we're gonna buy you um, throughout that time. But ever since we signed our first term sheet, you're in the game, right? Yeah. Like you're kind yeah, of in these conversations. Attention. You're in the let's say you're in the dating game, right? You're kind of we're always the bell of the ball in that way. Like we're always at Expo West and talking to all the investors, talking to all the companies. We're always at these PE dinners and like banking dinners. And so you're always getting invited to these things. And so you're always being courted in some way. And that's what's so funny. And I'm not an investment banker, but it's such a dance. Even from like your first step, like you don't know it's a dance, but we're, we were just- What makes you say building. that? Just out of curiosity. You mean the experience of going through it? Like, for, I'll give you an example. So from, from my perspective, when we were getting courted on certain things, it was a dance, but it was like, they knew the song. Mm. I didn't. Yeah. Right? Like, they knew. And what I mean by that for people listening is more of like, these people are sourcing deals. Yeah. Because they're working with, let's say, the big players at the top. And the big players are saying, hey, we're taking a look at companies that look and smell like this. And then they go, oh, let me go talk to people like you, let's say. Yeah. And it feels like a natural conversation, but they're asking you very specific questions yeah. that you can answer. And depending on how you answer them, it might lead you in a, you know, that's the thing. It's yeah. like. That's how, I mean, I, I think I felt that I, I knew that that was the dance maybe around 2016 okay. when we raised our Series C. Before then, it was just like, oh, we're so popular. Everyone wants to like meet us and we're like gaining traction. But Series C is when things became a little bit more real. Uh, we brought in Kavu as a private equity partner. And it was at that time, it's like, hey, how come you didn't, you know, talk to us? We've been friends for a while. And mm -hmm. I'm like, oh, I just thought that's because we we're actually friendly and friends. I didn't think that that was for a reason because you wanted to purchase a part of our company. And so what I realized in that is everyone has their own agenda. Totally. But I still didn't learn my lesson at that time in that we need to understand our agenda too. We we're always just trying to do everything for the best of the company, yeah. which is how it should be as a founder. Yeah, you're doing it for the right reasons, let's say. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Did at some point you feel like it was all going to go south in a real way, not, not like the fear of it? Um, I mean, there were some real crises that really hit us. I mean, Having to pay payroll when we're in the middle of a financing round, let's say, is I think something that every founder goes through, and that was a real stress. But there were a couple of times when, for example, during COVID and just even pre-COVID where supply chain issues, like we are dependent upon bottling kombucha into a bottle. 
the bottle is an important piece to you know, transporting the liquid to our consumers. And sometimes the bottles would just not show up. And even with our purchase order and prepayments, sometimes those containers would just not contain the amount of bottles we needed. And it was like, are you going to supply the container to Costco or are you going to supply it to Trader Joe's? Are you going to piss someone off? So those were the real moments where I'm like, oh my gosh, our business is going to implode. We're going to have a month of no sales. So those were like the real crises moments that I feel like really threatened our business. And then 2016 was similar in that we were completely sold out. Like our brewery was sold out. We were like in the- you were at capacity also? At like- capacity. We're in the middle of build out for our, our new brewery in Torrance where we're currently at. Yeah. And we went probably six to eight months of the year on an apology tour because we only had- so much kombucha and we had to allocate it out to all the retailers and so that was a real make or break moment for our business too Jeez. what's the barrel system like how big is the system making health aid it's a two to three week lead time so we could really ramp up if we needed to so it's not like alcohol and that there's barrels so to speak if we went from like five cases to five million cases that would be an issue yeah. but we are always really good about you know the snop processes and forecast. I mean, can't say we're always good about forecasting. We're always talking. Mm -hmm. Uh, We're always trying to get in the ballpark of what we needed. What were some of the like potential distractions where you guys maybe were really good as a team of like really focusing on flavors or Mm. were there any distractions where you look back on it and you're like, and I'm, I'm asking more of like it from an advisory standpoint for the listeners, like, was there something that you wish you had maybe stayed more focused on or were you guys maybe really good at that? Or were there any distractions at all that you were like, God, if we could only... We yeah. didn't do those things. So I would say through 2018, we said yes to everything. It was like death by a thousand cuts and in all different ways. So if anything came our way in marketing, field marketing, press seedings, influencers, whatever, we would say yes to because they all seemed great. And how big was your team at that time in 2018? Uh, we probably had about 120, 150 people total, but let's just say marketing had about 12. And so we said yes to everything in that way. Retailer-wise, we also said yes to a lot of things until we couldn't because of uh, like capacity issues. And then like, those were the real distractions is saying yes to the right things. And then you know, inevitably when we got bigger, it was like, oh, this company asked us to private label the X formula. But we're really not going to entertain that, but we kind of entertained it. It's like, why do we really entertain that? Uh, we did the whole feasibility. We met as a team, countless meetings as a team. Yeah. And then meetings were became a huge distraction too because you don't know it, but in the beginning, you're small, you're nimble, you're doing the thing. And then as your team grows, I feel like meetings ultimately kind of took over. Plus, it's like the shiny object, right? It's like you're a squirrel. It's like, ooh, let's focus on this innovation or let's do this innovation. I don't think we got distracted too much in that way, but... A lot of people kept on bringing things to the table. It's like, can't you just do the thing that you know that we're supposed to do? So if every, like five people are focused on new things, yeah. that's a lot of distraction. Yeah. Was there ever a point where you were thinking maybe building a brewery in the middle of the country or something like that? Yeah. 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 We were thinking East Coast, like having a warehouse, like a 3PL on the West co- uh, on the East Coast, sure. potentially doing a brewery out there. We did some deep analysis on it. And in the end, we just thought, the shipping costs versus having a whole like capital expense out there just wasn't worth it. Yeah. That's another thing to manage, I guess, yeah, from afar. Yeah. That's true. And the way that we made health aid, we couldn't necessarily guarantee that it would be the same over there. Because of the water? The water, the strains. I mean, we would use our kombucha strains and our cultures, but the wild yeast, just so many ass, so many factors to... to yeah, there's a lot of factors involved in that. Yeah, yeah. so um, it's not just, you know, pumping water out of a drain and yeah. carbonating it, right? So, so at what point do you guys start taking sort of these acquisition meetings seriously? Yeah, it was around 2019 because... Okay. Keep in mind at that this point. Pre-COVID? Pre-COVID. Okay. Um, yeah, wow. 2019. We're about six years after our Series A sign. And, and where are you at revenue-wise? Definitely, probably like sub-100. Okay. Um, okay. And sub-100 and second in the nation in terms of market share for the category. And we're already six years out of our term sheet, right? So investors like, oh, what can we get out there? And we start mm-hmm. taking these meetings. And everyone so interested in health aid. And we got some great meetings, people that I would pinch myself to be in if I was like, oh, 
if I talk to my younger self, I'm like, what? You talk to those people? It's crazy. But what also happened at the time were, were two things. One was a drastic market shift of what acquirers and strategics really wanted from companies is profitability. What was the thesis for the previous like 15 years before us was grow, grow fast, lose a modest amount, margins, 40%, okay, you're we'll good. Fix them later. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like, and if you have a hot brand, <sighs> strong growth story, we got you. That wasn't the, the <laughs> that wasn't the story at that time That's anymore. Yeah. And so we had that that shifted. And then the second thing that shifted <laughs> was the category because you know kombucha category was hot for a long time, probably like triple double digit growth year after year. And then all of a sudden, overnight, it seemingly went to single single digit growth. Healthy, we kept on growing at a super fast clip, taking market share, but the category wasn't growing. So naturally, strategics were like what's going on in this world where category is not growing, you're growing, but you're still not making money yet. So we need you to make money. So that was really the change in narrative for us. Oh my God. Yeah. And then COVID happened. That's rough. And we're like, okay, let's navigate this ship now. Yeah. Um, I guess that simplified it though. It did because we knew what we had to do. We were charged to get to profitability, which we did. We were charged to really get our operations to a point that's simpler for anyone to come into and all the while not losing our eyesight on growing being the brand to win being the hot brand like having that share of voice and making sure our operations were still really easy for anyone to come into that's kind of nice that's like the best covid story in some way because it does simplify things a lot it did um at the time we didn't think that sure, but yeah, no, you know looking chaos, back but... it kind of worked out to our favor and that's also when our investors were like, hey, like we've been with this since the beginning. We see a lot of potential in what this is. Let's take a majority of the business, have a transaction, give some liquidity back to friends and family, founders, mm -hmm. bring in a different private equity company, and we can all really partake in some good celebration here. In the upside, yeah. Yeah, and yeah. so that's where we were in 2021. And how long did it take for you guys to execute the... The deal. The deal yeah. um, it wasn't actually too long. I it was we closed in August of 2021, and it was. I remember I had my baby in March of 2021. Or no, I got pregnant. Yeah, I got pregnant around that time. Okay. So um, right when we closed, I remember like I have to go on bed rest now, and so it was about six months. And you guys, I'm sure, part of the deal was how long would each of you stay? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So Justin, he immediately planned to exit as soon as he hired a COO. Okay. And I, me and Dinah both stayed on. I was going to stay on for a couple years. That was still undetermined, um, really, whenever I, I think, was ready to leave. But we were negotiated into staying for X number of years, whatever that may be. It, that's probably the hardest thing ever, right? It was the hardest thing ever. Yeah. And no one ever talks about oh, that. God. I think... The ideal state. The like golden and, handcuff, per se, yeah. Yeah, handcuffs. You're getting also, a nice salary. You're yes. getting a nice bonus. Yeah, salary. It's like, um, <laughs> you're just, it's like too cushy yeah. in a sense. But no, and we're also just altruistically like, oh, we want the transition to go well. We want we want our baby to be okay. We want the people to be okay. Your team, your staff. Yeah, yeah. exactly. But what I wish a lot of founders would have mentioned when we talked about this is, you're not thinking about like the company actually has new ownership. Like the guardianship of your baby now belongs to someone else. Like you're no longer the final decision maker. And that's a hard thing to shift into when you're naturally and have been used to making the decisions and or leading. And so that was a big change. It felt like you're the parent, but you gave your kid up for adoption, but you still live in the house where they're being kept. I remember my, uh, this, the reason I'm like laughing is I just have PTSD from this moment where a friend of mine's company got acquired and it was like a fintech company. And so we go to the new office and of course in the old office we'd go and you know, he'd greet us pretty quickly. Yeah. And he had like the big office and we go to like meet him and now, you know, there's, we got to check in. Okay. No problem. And then he was basically in a janitor's closet, oh. like all the way in the back, oh. small office, you could just see it. You could yeah. just see it in him. Like he was like a withering away flower. Yeah. You know, yeah. Like the energy was gone. 
And I was like, oh, you're, you're realizing. Yeah. That's the good <laughs> way to describe happened. it. It was, you just saw it. It's you see, you're seeing it in someone's face, you know, where sure they have money, but they're indentured to that seat. Right. For two years. Right. Or, right. Yeah. In his case, it was two years. Right. A withering flower is a good way to describe it. It's like, you're yeah. still planted, but you're, you're still just there. there. Yeah. You have yeah. like one sprout. Like I'm doing it, it's but so sad. yeah. And then you got to go watch someone like lead your team. Yeah. And do all the talking mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Ugh, and give you new objectives, new KPIs or whatever they might be. Yeah, exactly. And you know, I think on some level the team was like, so what do we do? So it was, it was confusing sometimes too. What was it like for you personally financially? And so um, financially it was great. I mean, a lot of... Did it feel like a relief? It did, because, okay. again, I didn't take any any chips off the table the whole time. It felt like I had my nest egg yeah. that I could keep safe. Yeah. And awesome. at the time, I had just had my second baby. I have two very young kids, and so I'm like, okay, we started a family. I feel safe and secure in what I've built, mm-hmm. and no one can take this part away from me. Mm-hmm. And it felt like we did it, and we did it like together as like, co-founders and the team. And that felt really good. But the money part was interesting because, I mean, that year, like, I traveled a bunch. I had, you know, it was all sorts of fun. But after I officially left the business in 2023 last year, you know, you can have money, you can travel. But I felt so, I felt like a dandelion in the wind. Mm -hmm. I felt lonely. I felt depressed at times. I went through this whole, like, through the stages of grief, I would say, like, yeah, I'm excited. I'm, like, (laughs) I accept this. I'm done. But then I felt like, oh, I missed it. Like, oh, is this my life now? What is my life? Like, I have no one to talk to because everyone's working right now. And I'm traveling. Even when we're traveling, like my husband, he's still working because he still has his own thing going on. So I had to get through a huge identity shift in that way because it wasn't so much about the money anymore. It's more like, okay, well, what am I doing now? And relevancy became a whole question for me. What I, I love about this concept is like when so in 2012 you're sort of entering the world of an abyss right and then what's interesting is toward the end of your journey it's like you recognize in some way that you've become the guru Hmm. like you've acquired 10 years 12 years of skills where in some way you're a different person yeah with a massive amount of skills and you've seen this journey yeah all sides of it then you're done then you let's say you graduate or the story ends and now you're a new human with real purpose <laughs> right? and unbelievable amounts of talent. And you're just like, I got to, I got to go do this again. Right. Yeah. I got to no, do something. Right. Like I'm still, uh, I felt like a race <laughs> was still mom. ready to go. Yeah. Like I'm still feeling young. Um, like I still feel like there's more life to live. And so I definitely feel, didn't feel like my chat, my book was done. And so I had to explore that for myself and really what that meant. My purpose now is so different than what my purpose was back then. I think back then I was fueled by a lot of external pressures. It was like, I'm going to prove to people that I can do it or prove my dad wrong. I'm going to prove to the naysayers wrong. Like, I'm going to prove myself right. What made you feel like that? Like, did you go against the grain on a lot of things in your family? Yeah, 100%. I'm Obviously, definitely... entrepreneurship is probably... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not yeah, the like, safe. Your your parents might be like, "What are you doing?" Right, like you're my quitting dad, like, your job. Yeah, it's like, how much sure? did I spend on your education for you to like become yeah. what? And at the farm time, I was farmers market, so he's like, are yeah. you a, everyone's are laughing you a laborer at you. now." You yeah, exactly. Yeah. And what are you paying yourself? Nothing. Exactly. You, yeah, I get so it. I was always the one doing the different things, and my dad they wanted me to be safe. I get it, conservative, safe, but it sure. wasn't what I necessarily wanted. So I wanted to prove something, and I would be remiss if I wasn't. Wow thinking like ego and money was in it too. Like Absolutely. we wanted to build something. You want to win. Yeah, we wanted to win. Like yeah. that's what it was. Yeah. Now I would say like after exiting, my purpose wasn't that anymore. It wasn't like proving someone wrong. It wasn't like trying to like get money. And it wasn't like trying to live for someone else. I've had to do a lot of self-help, a lot of therapy, probably say, a yeah. lot of things in that way for myself. But where my motivation lies now are probably twofold. One is I love uplifting and empowering other entrepreneurs in this space. So specifically like female Asian American entrepreneurs who aren't typically sitting in this seat and don't even know where to go. And so I love lifting those people up. And then second is, you know, my kids are what two and four years old and they haven't seen me work. Um, <laughs> and so now I'm like, wait, I want them to have a model so of like work, but <laughs> I've worked before, yeah, right? And so yeah. now I'm kind of like, I want to be relevant for them. I want them to see a good model of what it means to be a woman who can 
do anything she wants and go after it and still win because I want to win. And so that's actually more my motivation now than anything that I had 12 years ago. Oh man, this is so funny. My friend sold a company when his kids were probably around the same age. Yeah. And he was working, but he was working in like the basement, just on his computer Yeah. in his little home right. office, you know? And I remember I would go visit him and he lived in Houston and his kids, they're like, Die- Uncle, they're like Mr. Diego, daddy doesn't work. This happened for five years. They had no <laughs> idea. His dad yeah. was a, one of the best coders probably in America. Yeah. Part of like seven, eight exits, but they just, you know, they couldn't comprehend it. And it was really interesting to see. Right. And he was like, yeah, they just think I'm like home all day doing nothing. <laughs> And I'm was, pretty sure. Yeah. yeah I mean, it's kind I, of amazing. Yeah. I mean, I think that's I what my kids think. And I don't want specifically for my daughter, but I also want my son to see like women like can do hard things and, and anything. Right. So actually one of my employees at health aid years ago, like he invited me to his daughter's birthday. She was 25 and he, I come to his house and um, he's like, Oh, you know, kids, this is well, Vanessa, my boss. And she's like, oh, you, a woman could be a boss. And I just, I was like, oh, I mean, I'm just a person on his team, you know, we're together. But like at that statement just struck me so much because I'm like, oh, I want I want to be able to inspire anyone that they can do anything, especially girls. Yeah. What do you want to do today? What do you want to do now? Well, at the heart of it, I just want to be involved in really cool shit. I think that's like the spirit of it. Yeah. Um, but, but like literally like in terms of doing it or in terms of investing in it. Probably all the above, um, but not as doing as I once did, I <laughs> yeah. should say. Yeah. Um, you don't want to be the Sherpa. Yeah, like I'm not <laughs> trying to be the sacrificial lamb any longer. Um, so a, I love investing. That's a loaded statement. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that is. Um, we'll move on from there. But um, So I have invested. So I'm an angel investor in a couple different startups. and I'm, Anything specific? Any um, uh, food and bev. So not okay. a lot of beverage, I think, because I know too much uh, to want to actively invest in beverage. But um, I am like an investor of Fly by Jing, which is you know, a, a Szechuan chili crisp started out, but one of the top condiments in the nation. There's also a couple like board seats and advisor roles that I've taken for food and beverage companies in that same spirit of trying to uplift other food and beverage entrepreneurs who just didn't really don't really know the game. I invest in a lot of women. Um, so there's this one company called Everest Nutrition. She created a toddler protein company. So I think it's perfect because as a mom, I don't think your kid's ever getting enough protein. So I'm, I'm big on investing in people, I should say, first and foremost, and I have to like the product second. Also, trying to buy a small business. So I'm looking at acquisitions of small, medium-sized businesses that are cash flowing, which is boggles my mind because some of these companies that range from like roofing, pothole repair, car washes, they net some pretty good money at the end of the day. Um, it's not, it's never going to be the iconic brand necessarily, but I'm just interested from like a overall portfolio play and what that could mean maybe as like a PE flip. So looking at that and also thinking about traditional Chinese medicine. So I don't know if I mentioned this to you, but I am a uh, benefactor of traditional Chinese medicine. Like I, my mom used to brew teas. I'm very much a believer in that world of natural homeopathic remedies. And I am into traditional Chinese medicine, but made modern. So how do I take those herbs that no one knows how to pronounce the names of, but make them relevant, good for you, also high margin, something that people get, something that's approachable. So I'm saying this on air because I'm also trying to hold myself accountable because I think one of the issues when you do have an exit is if you're not holding yourself accountable, like you can, the time just ex, you just <laughs> have things that fill your time too. So true, yeah. So especially I'm, with kids. Yeah, especially yeah. with kids. So um, I'm interested in creating a traditional Chinese medicine product. Not ready to drink because I'm I'm not into that, but uh, <laughs> something in a form factor that will maybe a tea based or something. But not a sort. beverage. It's not a ready to drink beverage. Okay. Yeah, because I just don't think the margins in that are that a creative. I love this about you. <laughs> I really that, do. That I'm interested in the adjacency the, of it. Yeah, yeah. You're like, I'm not doing that again. Yeah, yeah. Oh, God. What advice would you give people in the beverage world right now? It would be control your own destiny. And doing that by not being reactive to people trying to invest in your company, 
profitability. What are your margins? Just being so knowledgeable about your numbers and being green and the innocence of it all, I think is one aspect and it's cute. But then also if you're really starting a business, like you need to know your stuff. You gotta be sharp, uh, yeah. Yeah, sharp and also take control of your destiny and like pivot when you need to. What if there's an entrepreneur right now being like, I got a ready to drink product. I want to take it to market. <laughs> Or I got this hair loss um, company. You know, <laughs> which one would you tell them to go towards? I would. Oh, there's probably <laughs> a lot better margins in hair loss products than beverage. <laughs> I would say, but um, I I'm not trying to be a dream killer either. I definitely think it's less so about the the dream of it. It's a hundred and ten percent about the execution of it too. So, if like if you have this idea to go after it, go after it. But like, there's no wavering in it. You have to go after it and do it. Do it until no one else can do it better than you, and you know then then you have no regrets. And so if it, yeah. then if you push it, you pushed it. When you think about your story, like I hate to ask the lucky part of this, but it, it's almost the way I think about it is like your product obviously smashed, right? And so how much do you attribute to the three the three of you running the company versus the product? I mean, I think there's three things that really four things maybe that really made all all things align. Luck was a big part of it, luck and timing, right? Like if we came out with our product now, it would be a far different story, right? So luck definitely had a big deal. The three of us had this bond. We would call ourselves a trifecta. Like we trusted each other in a way that co-founders should, but not always do. We communicated in ways that really showed love and compassion at the end of the day, but we're also really real about the business and so we were all on the same page all the time so I do think our vibe together and then what that meant in terms of what that meant for the team curation culture the can do it gritty feeling of just running through walls made a difference product had to be like that was table stakes you had to have great product so I I just think that's like that had to be there I think the fourth thing too was this is going to sound super like hokey, but alongside like the luck, like we were optimists and like manifestors in that way. Like we were really trying to like step into what we believe to be true. So maybe that is like us as founders, but we, we lived it. Did this exceed your expectations? Yeah, it did. I mean, I would say like our expectations or our business plan was that we would get this company to $100 million dollars. And then we would sell or we would do something with it. We kind of did, you know. So in that way, we met expectations. And I couldn't have predicted that we would have sold to our investors. And that's not something that I would have expected. But it's definitely something that happened in a way that I'm happy with. So in that way, my expectations were exceeded. Yeah. Well, let's wrap on this. Where's the company today? The company, I mean, the team is doing awesome. They just launched a new product called Sunsip, which is a healthy soda. I'm such a fan of the brand curation, carrying it forward like you know, we would want. So I'm really happy and proud about that. Getting into amazing locations like Sweet Green. Um, oh, so wow. just furthering the penetration yeah, and, and just placement of where the product is. Yeah. Vanessa, thank you for coming on the podcast. Thanks for having me. It's fun. Thank you for tuning in. If you enjoyed this episode, share with your friends, your family, or anyone you might think might benefit from the conversation we've had today. And if you haven't already, please take a moment to leave a review on your favorite podcast platform. We'd greatly appreciate it. Your feedback helps us improve and reach more people who can benefit from our discussions. The best way to stay connected with us and get the latest updates on future episodes is through our social media channels. You can find us at Startup Storefront. We'll be back next Tuesday with another great episode. See you then.